Hi guys and welcome to this video converting from web forms to MVC and we're specifically going to look a little bit about what this is .NET, what .NET MVC is, why we might want to or might not want to convert from web forms and we're kind of going to look at the difference between perhaps porting an existing application where we're trying to leave it functionally the same as existing system and whether that's easy or difficult compared to perhaps a complete rewrite where we have an existing web forms application we want to start using mvc going forwards but we don't necessarily need to copy it exactly so a little bit about me my name's luke briner i'm based in cheltenham in the uk and I work for Cotswold IT Consulting, which are a specialist consulting firm dealing largely with software, scalability, security, that sort of thing. And this is actually a topic I wrote about a couple of years ago. So it's been quite a long time since I've actually done this process, but I have ported an application from Web Forms to MVC and learned a lot of this on the way. So. It is real advice. It's not just stuff copied off the Internet, but at the same time, it's been quite a long time. So hopefully I haven't missed anything too major. So the first real question, I guess, when we look at this whole topic is why we might convert from web forms to MVC. And there are really quite a few reasons to, to do so. So in terms of, say, the support from Microsoft, now there's no official end date for the support for web forms but the reality is now that things are generally moving to dotnet core which doesn't support web forms the chances of web forms being supported for a lot longer are probably quite low so there's kind of a, a small reason there that we might think let's try and at least keep with with what's current and then you have the issue of skill sets of new employees so if you're recruiting there's a lot greater chance you'll find somebody who does C Sharp MVC more so than C Sharp or, or VB.NET as well in terms of web forms. So that can be quite a big deal, especially in the UK. There's quite a lack of kind of skilled developers. So that might be something worth considering. And then also the, the skill set when people move from another language into the world of .NET. So if you have somebody who's, say, a, an experienced PHP developer, then they've probably already come across MVC. So although the language is different, they will understand the concepts fairly well and will be able to cross-train relatively easily. However, if they were moving to web forms, that would be much more difficult. There's an issue of support in third-party libraries. So more libraries are going to play nicely with .NET MVC than do so with web forms. So you're kind of tied in quite a lot to Microsoft's built-in stuff when using web forms. You get a lot more options with MVC, not just in terms of the actual C Sharp libraries, but also front-end frameworks and things. They will all play nicely with MVC, but not all of them will play nicely with web forms. Then .NET Core support is probably quite important moving forwards. .NET Core performance-wise is a lot better than .NET Framework. So if you want to really kind of take advantage of that, advantage of, say, running .NET on Linux and things like that, then you're going to have to go to MVC instead of Web Forms. Then there's this kind of concept of reducing the page weight. So when you submit a request, if you think about somebody, let's say, logging in. Now, if they only have a box, let's say, email address and password, two controls, a submit button, a very small form, you would really expect only a very small page request, a very small HTTP request to be made to the server. But on Web Forms, in fact, the entire page would be posted because in Web Forms, not only the entire page is encapsulated in a form, but you then have this big view state object, which means every single request is, is very bloated. And that in its own right can make the, the system slow down, even though the framework on the back end is not particularly slow in web forms. In MVC, the form scope is much narrower. So you might literally just get those two values posted instead of the entire page. So that can make a significant difference in terms of optimizations. There's then the idea of separating HTML from business functionality. And this is obviously quite a popular concept in the development world that I kind of want my designers to be able to design stuff and maybe produce 
vanilla HTML. And then the more easily I can take the HTML and put it into my web application, the easier it is for everybody, the better, the quicker, the cheaper it is to do. Whereas in web forms, the kind of the business functionality, the HTML is all mixed in together. You have limited control over the HTML in addition to that. So really, it's not very designer friendly. Might not be a problem for you, but if design is important, then MVC is going to give you a lot more flexibility than web forms. In terms of kind of the back end system, the way web forms works has a relatively high overhead. So if you're using it for fairly straightforward kind of request response operations, then it can be, but it's not necessarily slower than MVC. We then have a few more advantages here. So route based navigation, if you've used most web frameworks, it allows you to have kind of not only need to URLs, but URLs that perhaps match the intent of what you're doing rather than having to map to a physical page or a physical item on the server. So route based navigation MVC can be really cool for search engine optimization. It means that when people Google you, they're going to find, you know, nice URLs that kind of explain what's going on rather than random ASPX file names. Views can use any compatible framework. So by default, when you create a, an MVC application, you get the Razor view engine, but actually you can use any .NET view engine. I know there are ones that support things like Angular and Vue and all the rest of it as well. But uh, the Razor one's pretty cool. That's what we're going to use for these examples. But it separates that away so you can kind of do it however you want to do it. As mentioned, a lot more customization of look and feel because this is much more HTML centric than, say, server code centric. Then you can kind of do what you want with forms, with controls, with style sheets and all the rest of it. Another advantage is the ID generation that you used to get in web forms. If you, for instance, put items inside a master page or inside a page that is inside a master page, then in order to create um, unique IDs, the system would start prefixing things with the name of the master page or the name of the placeholder or these kinds of things. And so if you're trying to use JavaScript to actually pick these items up, it can be really hard. You pretty much have to run the page up, find what the ID is, and then kind of put it into your JavaScript and then hope that you never move it so its ID changes where Whereas in MVC, you can pretty much give it whatever ID you want to give it. And another, probably a big deal for some of you moving towards perhaps larger applications where you want kind of continuous deployment and say higher code quality is MVC is much easier to unit test because you can call it an action on a controller directly from a unit test and test at least all the functionality of it and that you get a view back, you get the correct response code and all the rest of it. Doing that in web forms is almost impossible, but certainly takes a, a lot more time to, to set that up. So, so that's great. But let's look at the other reasons why you might not want to convert from web forms into MVC because most decisions in software are, um, you know, have pros and cons. Uh, don't do it if you just want better performance. Unless you're going to move to .NET Core, the potential performance benefit of web forms is not necessarily any better. And I've seen a different tests. I've seen some that show web forms being slower, but most of that's probably due to the, the page weight of request and response. But in terms of the backend framework, there's not a great deal of difference in terms of performance. Maybe if you have to re-architect your solution to, to fit into MVC, that might make it faster generally, just because you're going to kind of make some better decisions than before. But it's not a, a strong reason by itself to move. Also, from a very practical point of view, if your existing development team skill set is very strongly into web forms, that's less and less likely, but it is possible that you've got 10 people who've been coding for 20 years who are kind of experts in web forms who've never really touched MVC. Then you need to seriously consider whether you want to move because MVC is kind of a different beast. You can't learn it in five minutes and expect to be as good as you were at web forms. So that's something worth considering. If the application is very complex or fragile, it kind of really depends here as to your risk appetite as a company. And I'll come back to that in a minute, but you might kind of think, do you know what, this application is so fragile or so overly complex that either the time it would take to port it to MVC or the number of things I'm likely to break by doing it is just not worth doing. So again, that's just a practical concern.
If your application already has a strong page concept, so MVC is really designed around actions rather than pages. So one page might trigger a number of different actions depending on what the user does. Whereas in web forms, you very much got this concept a little bit like a, a kind of Windows application that you kind of have a page and, and, that, and you do everything on one page that all connects to the same page code in the background. So if that works well for you, then that might be a good reason to stay with web forms for the time being. And the other thing is if you have a corporate application that you're not too worried about what it looks like and it is, makes heavy use of data bounds, controls, grid views, you know, tree views, all these kind of crazy stuff, they're actually quite difficult to do in uh, MVC, you can get libraries, obviously, but they take a bit more work to do because MVC is designed to be more of a, a web application framework rather than, say, a, a database connectivity application. So Web Forms probably does this slightly better. You've got these, you know, big kind of grid views of data and you're adding and removing stuff all the time. Then certainly that's quite a quick and easy job to do in Web Forms. So a couple of things to consider. And this comes back to something I mentioned right at the beginning which is there There are two ways to kind of look at what you're doing here. Are you looking to kind of port the existing application, kind of saying, I've I've got what I've got now and I'm, I'm happy with the functionality. I just want to move it to MVC because maybe it's going to be a little bit quicker. Maybe it's just going to update the code a little bit or just give us kind of a, a bit of a clean sheet to move forwards. Now, that's fine. It's possible. But again, it can be quite difficult. And if your risk appetite is too low and you're thinking there's no way we're going to be able to do this without breaking it, then maybe you can do a complete rewrite instead. So the process is obviously could be largely similar. But when you're doing a complete rewrite, you maybe get the luxury of saying, do you know what? We're just going to tell our customers this whole piece of functionality is going to be removed. It doesn't get used very much. It's broken all the time. It's got loads of bugs in it. Let's just get rid of it or maybe add it back in at a later date and make a, in some ways a replacement project, a, a replacement product, sorry, a new product that is intended to do the same job, but could get away with doing it in a different way. It could look different. It could look a lot newer and fresher and everything else. So the complete rewrite is te tends to be a, a longer job. It sounds like it should be quick, but understanding your existing application can take a long time. So capturing all of that appropriately for a new application, it's going to take probably at least twice as long as you think it will. And it's going to make you then ask questions that you've maybe never asked before about your current system. And a classic example of this is in mortgage systems. It's possible to have a bug in a mortgage system, but because the bug is there and has been used in previous mortgage applications, you actually have to leave the bug in there so that you don't risk changing any historical numbers. Or if you applied for the same mortgage now, it needs to come out with the same numbers as the old mortgage that had the bug in the system. So understanding that and spotting that and making a decision on that can be quite tricky so a rewrite isn't everything it's cracked up to be but there's some kind of decision about whether you think it's worth trying to pretty much drag every piece of functionality across or whether you're going to say do you know what we've got what we've got there let's leave that let's just start building it again from scratch from the ground up maybe cutting some stuff out in the process and that might be easier might be more difficult but that's something for you to consider so let's look at when we approach this issue of do we do it? I mean, I think there are some questions we can ask up front and some of these questions I've got here. We can then spend some time prototyping and getting some kind of idea, capturing the complexities of the existing system before we make the decision as to whether we're going to do this or not. Uh, at the end of the day, we can't sit on our products forever. We can't leave them alone forever. But there is a question of both when we're going to do something. And the second question is, are we going to port it as is in place with all the functionality? Are we going to write it completely from scratch? Are we going to do something else? Are we just going to throw it in the bin and buy one off the shelf from another company? Maybe time's moved on. Maybe what we're trying to do is now something that everyone else is doing. So actually, it would be cheaper to buy in the solution. But we can do some... Uh, some homework first, we can ask some initial questions.
A couple of things is you can't automate this. So the, the architectures are really quite different between web forms and MVC. The fact that they're both web applications, the fact that they look like they're the same from the user's point of view is not really the point from a technical point of view because they're quite different. You can't automate it because an automated system is not going to understand where a page needs to be split out into several actions, where you need multiple forms or separate forms, or what you know whether an action does one thing or two things. So you can't automate it. And like with any software, you will experience the 80-20, sometimes called the 90-10 problem, where you might kind of look at it and go, oh, this seems really easy. I've done most of, I've done 80% of it in a short amount of time. This is really doable only to then find out that the last 20% of it takes you, you know, another two years to, to finish. So you kind of need to consider the difficult parts of it probably sooner than you need to consider the easy parts. You know that the easy parts can be ported. It's a question of how hard it is to port the hard parts. And you need to understand MVC to do it properly. And that might go without saying, but just because you're a .NET developer, just because you're an expert in web forms, doesn't mean you're going to read through a, an article on MVC and go, great, um, I, I understand that completely in 10 minutes, and now I'm going to do this really, really well. If you don't understand MVC well enough, quite simply, you'll end up with a different mess to the mess you started with, and that's not going to help anybody. So if this is something that's a big project, maybe the first time you've gone into MVC, you should seriously consider some formal training. You should certainly be spending a good time even on stuff like, you know, Code Academy and those kind of places where you can just run through loads of different scenarios, get some ideas. How do I create user controls? How do I, you know, have more than one form on a page? How am I handling 10 different buttons on the same form, et cetera, et cetera? So, you know, spend some time. Don't underestimate how important that is. Because the first couple of times you use MVC, you won't understand how to change the the kind of web forms domain into the MVC domain. Whereas once you understand it, of course, it will only take you five minutes because you, you'll totally get how to refactor it. So that's kind of important. That said, although we obviously haven't got time to do a you know 10 week course on MVC, I just want to kind of introduce you roughly to what MVC is and give you maybe a broad outline of the kind of some of the differences that you'll see mvc model view controller probably already understand that a model is really a data object and should largely stay as a data object now that's quite controversial i know some people put control logic inside a model personally i don't like that i like the idea of a model just being data which we'll, we'll look at my example in a minute then you have a view, and obviously the view in this case is if it's a razor view is designed for the web browser. So it's strongly HTML driven. So it's much less like web forms being its own curious language with these funny server tags in it. It's a bit more like well, here's HTML, but every now and then we're going to inject some kind of server side expression that will be evaluated just in the same way that every other language like Java and PHP do that. So we'll see that in a second. And then the controller is largely where the control logic exists. So a controller is a control object, tends to have actions. Actions will take a request, maybe do something with a request, maybe not. Populate a model, choose a view to, to display that model, and then pass that back to the user. So we'll see examples of all of these and what they roughly look like. So here's a really simple example. Uh, I've made these up just for the presentation. So... I apologize if there are any typos in there, but names that look like they should match probably should match. So if I made a typo somewhere, um, if you see the word contact in there, it's probably wrong because I copied this from a contact page. But a model class, the nice thing about model class, you can easily generate it to match a database table. So for any kind of entity driven web application, which is a lot of them where you have, say, a user table, you can have a user model and you can bind them directly together. You can use ORM, which is object relational mapping, things like entity framework. There are plenty of others available that you can just say, there's my user table, generate me a model. And then once the model is generated, you can then decorate it with these attributes like email address, like a display. The name one there is just one I invented. So it could be a name attribute, which which uses a regular expression maybe to say what isn't isn't allowed to be put onto uh, into that, that piece of data. 
And in, in terms of code first, you also have the ability to generate database tables from the model. So you can do it in both directions, but what you end up with is something that's very easy to understand. Customer model represents a customer in a database. So I've got an email and a name. Obviously, I could have a customer ID. I would, you know, could have loads of other things. But just for an example, hopefully that's fairly easy to understand. In terms of most models, you'll have a public property with a getter and a setter. Generally needs to be public because the model binder will need to set the values when it's binding stuff. And obviously you want the getter if you're passing this into one of your actions so you can read the things out of it. So fairly straightforward. You've got a lot of flexibility, a lot of built-in attributes, a lot of custom attributes that you can add. You know, you can write your own if you want, if you want to validate something in a special way. But that's basically a model. There's not really a lot to it. There's also a concept of a view model, which, to be honest, is kind of exactly the same as a model. But a view model is called a view model because it's a model that's been created for a specific view. So if you had a view, let's say, that had maybe a customer and had all the orders for that customer underneath it, then do you bind the customer or the orders to that view? Well, the answer is you create a view model, which maybe has one customer and then an innumerable of orders. And then that becomes your view model and you bind the view model to the view. And then the view just has to say, well, in this case, put model.customer.blah. And in this one, enumerate all of the model.orders.blah. And that's that's what a view model is. So again, nothing particularly special about view model. The only difference is it's not going to be bound directly to a database entity. So that's model. So a view, this example is Razor. Like I say, that's the default engine that's used in Visual Studio. It's pretty handy. It looks like mostly like HTML. You can use other ones. I've seen people use things like Angular and stuff like that, depending on, on what your poison is. But a nice thing about Razor is it's basically C Sharp with this at symbol that you see all over the place. And pretty much as soon as you see an at, you know that the, the next thing that you're going to see is basically C sharp code and that will either run to the end of the line and then kind of revert back to HTML or in the case of say begin form you can see there's an open curly bracket in which case it's generally clever enough to know that inside the curly brackets you're actually writing code so I probably don't need the at symbol on the HTML but basically it seems to somehow work work out whether you're writing raw HTML or writing um, C sharp code without having to put loads of delimiters around stuff. But this is kind of a, a fairly simple example. This is bound to uh, that actually where it says user model that should say customer model. Um, that's like I say is a typo but don't worry about that. Most of the binding in this case uses the HTML helper. So all of the these methods here you see what we're doing is we're saying I want to put a text box, in other words, an input type equals text, like one of these. Um, whoop. And I want to bind it using this HTML helper calling text box for. And in this case, I just have an expression, the expression that takes uh, the model, whatever I've bound to here. And in this case, I want to bind it to model.email and model.name. We'll see what that looks like when it's rendered later on. But the nice thing about the way the model binding works is you could just type in an input field here. So I could put input type equals text name equals name. And that's all I need to do. And if I put that in there, that would work identically to this. The only difference, of course, is in this case, I get some strong type checking on here. I can make sure I've bound it to the correct field. And then obviously, if I'm doing things like label for validation for those kind of helpers, which I haven't done on this model here, then I could add all of those in and make sure that I've bound them all to the same name. You can also pass in HTML attributes here. You can give it an ID if you want it to have a specific ID. You can give it one if you want to add CSS classes and stuff. You can do all of that here, whereas in web forms, you didn't really have much control at all over what HTML got rendered. But here it's going to render the most simplest HTML it can. It uses the name attribute to know which field it's bound to. And then the rest of it's kind of up to you. So that's that's quite nice because it keeps this much closer to HTML. The other thing that's important to note here is there's no view state. 
So there we'd have an anti-forgery token, which we need to have anyway for form posting. We don't have the view state. So even if this was a complex page, we're not going to have, you know, 200, 300 kilobytes of basically state information. All of the state is inferred from what's happening just in the normal HTML forms, which is nice. So the only other thing that you're likely to see in here, which we don't have in this example, is you'd like to see lots of use of if statements. So in web forms world, you would have had things like a login control. And in the login control, you could say if you're logged in, show a log out button. If you're not logged in, show a, a sign in button, that kind of example. But in MVC, because you don't have those server controls anymore, you're more likely to have an at if user dot is logged in, whatever the method is, then do some stuff in here else do some other stuff so you're going to see a lot of a lot more if statements than you would do probably in web forms and the other thing that you'll see is you'll see for each being used in place of things like a repeater control in place of things like the grid view you'll see a for each rendering multiple rows just kind of in much more normal c sharp a, a normal c sharp way rather than in uh, a kind of a magic web forms way but hopefully that's kind of fairly self-explanatory. You can, you know, there's lots of other things you can do here. You can specify all kinds of um, view bag and view, uh, not view state, view bag and view data elements. You can have stuff that gets passed back into the action, but and then only lasts for like one iteration. So you've got kind of different things that you can do here. But the basic gist of it is it's as much HTML as you want. And then you inject things either dynamically like this. You can pass in expressions like the current date or, you know, the person's name or whatever. You can obviously just have static text and you can have anything here that you actually want to bind to a model. So then if we look at our controller example, I've actually removed some of the default actions from here. So this is just kind of a, a very a cut down version with most of the useful functionality taken out. But effectively, a controller has actions and these actions are what are responsible for being on the end of some kind of root. So if you had my site slash home slash register, it would hit one of these two actions because they're called home register. You can override that, but that's what works by default. And in the earlier versions of MVC, it's worth noting that this controller here would either be a kind of, I uh, can't remember the namespace, I think system.web.controller or system.api.controller. So there were two different controller base classes, and that's because of the way they work by default of returning views or returning data like JSON and those kind of things. In the newer versions of MVC and MVC5, that's gone out of the window, and now there's a single controller that can handle um, views or JSON or, you know, XML or anything else you want to return. And it does all that automatically. So just, just so you know that if you look at some older examples, you might find that things like, say, you got an action result here, but in the old one, that might have been called an action response. I can't remember what, what they were called before, or it might be called an MVC result or something like that. So some of these names might be different, and that might just be the difference between old MVC and new MVC. The other thing to note is, although here we've got register, we, we would have a register view. It's not necessarily the case that every action has one view and every view has one action. So this action could return the normal view for register. It could return an error view. It could return a, a session timed out view. It could return a number of different views depending on context. And in the same way, an error view could be returned by lots of different actions. So usually there's a one-to-one -one correlation for the normal use of the action but in general there isn't a direct uh, certainly not enforced you can have one view shared by different places and that kind of comes back to a bit of a, an architectural philosophical question of if i call register and there's an error does it make sense to redirect to the error action to see the error page in terms of caching in terms of um you know the, the response that gets returned in uh, to the browser or do i just want to return say you know say a 500 and an error view directly from register so my url still says register but there's actually an error logged um, and it just kind of depends on how you're logging errors it depends on what you want the user to see it depends if you're going to customize the, the pages and lots of other things but yeah there's no direct correlation <laughs>
The normal pattern of things in a controller is that you will have one HTTP GET and one HTTP POST action. Notice they have the same name and the only difference here, obviously they need to have a different signature in order to both be called register. So the difference is the POST takes a model and we will look at model binding in a second, but that's the difference between the two. So when you call GET, uh, register get the framework will say well you've called register but there are two of them but this one's decorated with get so I know this is the one you want if you placed a model in here and you didn't pass any data to populate the model there'd still be a model it just none of the properties would be set on it and likewise if you took the model out of here then clearly you wouldn't be able to access anything from that model inside this method but it finds them purely on the the place uh, on the the attribute and then if you had more than one so if you had register with one parameter register with two parameters register with three the system would try and find the best fit but it <clears throat> is not usually a good idea to rely on that because if for instance one of your parameters is not set you won't always necessarily know what the framework will do with that whether it will find the one with less parameters or whether it will find the one with more parameters and fill it in with empty or null so try and avoid using um, kind of magic glue to make your things work properly in terms of a get gets will generally create a new model it might or might not populate that from database depending on whether this method takes an id or not so if this was say get a, a blog post this might be blog post with id because I'm getting a specific blog post, in which case I'll load this from database somehow, then I return it. If there isn't an ID or it's not set, I'm going to create a new blank one and return it to the view. And then the post generally takes a model. That's all the data that the end user has typed in and been posted back. You then check validation is correct. If it is correct, you might update the database. You might redirect to a different view, back to the index page or something, uh, or, or whatever, you don't have to. And if model state isn't valid, you will send the same view with the same model. So then the user will see the validation errors. So that's kind of the, the general pattern of, uh, of the actions in the controller. But really the kind of probably the biggest difference between web forms and MVC is how models are populated from the form that you submit and actually how they're bound when you request a view as well. So in web forms, this kind of happened automatically most of the time, so it should have worked automatically. And it used a combination of server controls and view states. So the general concept was once I was on a page, every time I go back to the code, I can change something. It automatically works. Everything automatically gets updated and everything just works magically. If I post back again, all of the values of all the controls are all just there and they all just work. And kind of that was okay, except that, the problem of putting all of this extra additional state into this view state, which was basically a big serialized blob of data, which could, you know, get to several hundred K in size. So it wasn't necessarily small. All of that is getting posted back. Even if you were just saying, I want to delete this item, you're going to post back all of that data to the server just for it to go, oh yeah, they want to delete it and then delete it. So you're kind of getting a lot of easy functionality, but as soon as you wanted to do anything more advanced, you would suddenly come up to problems where you couldn't do certain things in complicated pages because either you'd end up with this massive view state or it didn't quite do what you wanted it to do and you didn't have the ability to change it because it in some ways was so complicated what it was having to do that trying to change that would probably end up breaking things. So they didn't let you change it. So you could disable the view state in web forms, but as soon as you disable the view state, then loads of things stop working as you probably expect them to. And then you start kind of taking the hit on the server because every time the page comes back, you go, oh, is this a delete? No, well, then I need to load everything back up again from database just to populate everything, just to know what to do next. So that was kind of a bit labored, a bit long winded, and it was kind of was really away from how the web normally works. So in MVC, the view that we looked at earlier, the example view, is rendered something like this. So this is just a, uh, a snipping out of the, the actual page that gets sent back to the browser. So it only includes the form. Note that I've added in the line breaks and stuff just to make it neater so they won't match exactly what was on that, that um, example. I've taken out the value of the request verification token just because it's long and ugly. And what I've done here is I've highlighted the, the bits that Razor has added 
by the attributes that I've used on my example. So where I've bound the text box to the name of my model, that's the only piece of data that's any different than any other input. So if I had been writing this manually, I'd just write input, might give it an ID, might not, but give it a name. It's got an empty value and it's type text. There's nothing magic in there's no magic glue, no magic JavaScript or weird stuff like that. It's literally just an input, which means I can style it how I want. I can interact with front end frameworks how I want. I can do all of that in, in a way that I'd want to and expect to. But by using that text box for, I've made sure that I've spelt that correctly. Otherwise, if I do this manually and I make a typo, the form's still still going to work. It's still going to come up. It's still going to post back. But then one of my properties is going to be missing because it won't bind that back up. This example here, I bound it to the email. But note that because email had an email address attribute, it's added some extra validation attributes here. And that means if I've added the JavaScript into this page, which actually I haven't, then the JavaScript can use these when the form's posted to basically say, right, I know this is an email val validator because it has the name email in it. So I know what that means. I know how to validate this input. I know the error message to display in the client if this doesn't work. Other than those bits, same as this. It's got the name here, which is how it binds it to the model when you post back. That bit was the verification token, which we have to add for cross-site scripting protection. And these bits are added automatically. The default method is post and the default action is the action that I've just sent this, this view back from. So I haven't had to type those in. That's automatically. I can override any of these. Obviously, I can obviously do loads of other stuff. The input itself was just a hard coded submit button. So again, I don't have to do anything special there because this is just a form and it's not using magic glue like web forms did to actually make these events happen. It's just a form that gets posted back and then the action will decide what to do with that. So what happens then if this form is displayed? I fill in some details here. Let's assume um, you know I may or may not have done the validation correctly. I hit the submit button. Then we're going to go back to the controller again. And like I said earlier, the controller is going to say, right, your action here was home register. This is the home controller. This is the register. But you've said that method is post, which 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 it would normally be. So I know that I can. That's the only one here that I can select as your candidate action. And here I can see that you want a customer model populated. A customer model has an email and a name. And because you have posted back an email and a name, I can bind these two values automatically into the two properties of the customer model. Now, note that if I've enabled client validation, which is enabled by default, and I've added the right JavaScript, then the validation would already have occurred on the client. But I can't assume that's happened. I can't assume that the client will validate the data. So I always need to do it on the server side as well. And that's as simple as saying if model state dot is valid. That's all we have to do. That will run the validators um, on the server side. And we'll just double check that the data that's entered has been valid. Usually what happens if it isn't, you return that model, that same model back to the view. And doing that will cause it to show the errors and say, actually, this, you know, that email address isn't valid or you need to enter a name or whatever that the validation might be. If it is valid, then obviously you do whatever you need to do. This is registering a customer, probably update a database, add a new row, you know, update. Well, we wouldn't update an existing one here, but update the database, do some stuff. And again, we might redirect. We might stay on the same page and say this has now been saved and let the user continue to edit it. But no magic view state data, literally just the model binder looking at that data and making its best guess at putting the, the properties from your form into the customer model. Now, one thing that's important to know here is that the model binder isn't a clairvoyant. It can't see into the past and the future. All it can do is look at the data that's been posted back in the form. And if there are things that are missing, then the model binder will simply ignore them. It won't go, oh, your customer's got an email, but there wasn't an email in the form error. It will just say, well, no, if there's no email, I can't set the email. 
And of course, that's fine in a simple model like this where there are only two properties and you're probably going to notice. But if this is quite a big form, there could easily be one or two that are missing. And you might not realize until several weeks later that there's an empty column in the database because this hasn't been bound properly. So only items that are explicitly included inside the form are going to be seen by the model binder. So it doesn't if you've got a, a, a hidden field out here or another text box out here, it doesn't matter because that's not going to get posted back. Only what's in the form gets posted back. And this contrasts with web forms because in web forms you had a form outside the entire page. So everything that you posted always came back to the server. It was always available for binding. In MVC, that's not true. Only what you put inside the form is going to be available to the model binder. So what this means, and this is kind of an important learning lesson when you're porting, is you might have to do something like this. Let's say you've got two registration buttons on the same page. Um, and let's say they're basically the, you know, the name, same name, same email. But in this case, well, if I've got two buttons are going to do two different things, then that means I need two forms. Let's call them register and register admin. And that's telling it what action and what controller to go to. So let's say I've got two different actions. Well, two different actions means two different forms. Two different forms means two different submit buttons. But then that also means that this fixed value, the email, the name, they're all duplicated because they're inside the same form. There is a workaround for this, which we'll look at later. But really, this means one of two things in, in headline terms. Either we need to split these into two pages because that might make more sense to views, if you like, or we need to do some kind of dirty hacking around or we need to duplicate everything. Now, that's OK. That's valid. It just means you'll end up with two inputs that have the email in it two hiddens that will contain that fixed value, whatever it might be. But that's the only way to make sure that that action receives all of that data in there. Obviously, if that action doesn't need the data, let's say you have an error message that gets displayed up at the top of the page. You might say, well, that error message never comes back to the action, in which case it doesn't matter. You don't need to include it in here. But if it's stuff that the action needs, it needs to be included inside the form tag. So Let's now go through a number of the, the bigger changes. Now, there are in some ways quite a few different changes. I've tried to kind of group them into big, big kind of categories, but we don't really have the time to go through every single one in great detail. But just to show you some of the, the headline stuff. The first thing is the form. So we've already kind of covered most of this. Web forms wraps the entire page in a form. And then it uses JavaScript to identify which button gets clicked. So when you click a button, it sets a hidden field to say effectively it was the submit button or whatever. The whole form gets posted back to a single event handler, it like hidden inside the framework. And then that framework will then say, ah, because the target is the submit button, I'm going to call this an event handler or this other event handler or whatever. So again, that's great. It's kind of free and easy functionality. But it kind of come, brings you problems when you're trying to use things like, say, the bootstrap modal. So I had a problem where bootstrap takes your div that you want to be a modal and it moves it right down to the bottom of the page outside of the form, which, of course, in most cases is fine, because what it's saying is I'm going to create a duplicate of this code. I'm then going to copy it into a modal that's going to be placed somewhere where all of the overlapping and the Z order and all the rest of it's going to work properly. The problem, of course, with doing that is all of a sudden none of that data gets posted back in web forms anymore. So there's a good example of how web forms trying to be clever actually doesn't work in a particular scenario. Because MVC doesn't restrict you to that, you can put forms only where you need to. So as I mentioned before, you can have a much smaller request. It gives you all of that extra control, but it does mean you have to do some extra work like we looked at with event handlers and uh, tying up actions to buttons. So we've kind of already touched on this a few times. This is probably one of the areas that's going to cause you the most pain. Like I say, it's very easy to be very lazy in web forms. You have a page, chuck a few more buttons on, no problem. You just tell it what event to call and it all just magically works. Of course, that's helpful. In reality, because of all the magic glue that web forms is doing, it can lead you, A, to make lazy decisions. Why create another form when I can just chuck another button on here and just do everything 
in the same form. But also it means that when you try and push this system to its limits, you start dynamically adding controls or buttons. You suddenly find that there's things that don't work properly. You then need to start doing dodgy things like manually setting the event target. Is that going to break anything? Is it even going to work? So I've found plenty of times where I've started to do quite advanced things that seem to be doable. And then you find out a load of stuff doesn't work. So Button handlers are nice in web forms for simple scenarios, but quickly show uh, their kind of limits. In MVC, you know, in the web way of viewing things, a submit button shouldn't have any special knowledge. It should just be a form submit button, post back to the server, and it's up to the server really to know what to do with that. So if you're porting web forms to MVC and you have a page that has one or more buttons on it, you've got a couple of different choices about how to deal with it. And we're just going to look at those quickly. So one button is obviously easy. One button becomes a form, a form usually with a much smaller scope. That form includes all the data I need to pass back to the code behind. That's dead easy. The second one is, well, I've already shown an example of this. You can have separate forms on the same page. It's kind of clean and as much as you can see what's going on, this button in this form is to do this action. This button in this part of the form, or sorry, in this form, in this other part of the, the view is to do a different action. It can be clean. It can be simple, especially if maybe the first form uses X, Y, and Z, and the, the second form uses one, two, and three. Maybe they're two different things. There is that danger of duplication of fields. You might not like that. You might think it's ugly and it's unclean. You might be able to say, well, actually, this button really is only a navigation process. Does it need to post back at all? Maybe I just change it into a effectively a, a hyperlink style to look like a button or even a hyperlink. It doesn't really matter. And just do a do a navigation, do a, a get a get request to another route. They're dead easy to use. And it means you don't need to post back. So you don't need a form. And then you might only end up with the first option here, one button in one form. So that's another one. Uh, the probably the neatest way of doing it and this is where it can start uh, you can start ending up getting a lot more code than you had before maybe where you have one page you end up needing to have you know four pages and an example of this is i was doing some stuff with a two-factor setup page on an old application setting up two-factor authentication was basically one web form page and he did things like show a barcode, type in the, the code to check that you've captured the barcode correctly or the QR code correctly. You press the submit button, it checks the code, it says yes, it's okay, do you want to edit it? All of these things were done in the same web forms page just because it was the easiest way to do it. But actually when we went to MVC, we said, you know what? These really need to be separate actions with separate views. So when we go into the page, if it's a new user, we could go straight to the setup page. Once setup has been submitted, it can go to the confirmation action, which maybe just displays a success message. If we want to edit it, we hit an edit button that takes us to the edit form. So just by separating it out, sure, we ended up with four or five forms instead of one. But actually, each one was much smaller, much clearer, much easier to understand. And it removed a load of state information that you otherwise have to kind of understand in web forms in order to make sure that they don't end up clicking a button at the wrong time and getting the system confused. So you can separate out two buttons into two forms, and that's the nice thing. Uh, there is also a dirty hack, um, which is to put a name on the buttons which um which isn't there by default and then inside the action you can pass a parameter to the action then inside the action say well if name equals register do this if um if name equals register admin do something different it's a bit nasty kind of allows you to keep one form and have two buttons inside it but it's not really the spirit of what you're trying to do. So I try and avoid that. But I think there was one or two places where that was what I did initially, um, just before I could work out how to do it properly. Um, and yeah, clean up your forms, like I just mentioned. Separate register admin from register. Are they two different views? Make two different views. Uh, have two forms on a page, have two forms on a page. I mean, you could um, you could kind of do do a number of different things. But really, this is one of those areas where it's going to force you to think a lot more along the lines of MVC, uh, where you have a, a separate view and a separate action for each kind of action.
rather than just um, putting it all in together. So once you make those architectural changes and once you start doing it, you know, these things will make more sense as well. When you first start doing it on some of the pages, it'll be quite a struggle. Another area is validation and in validation, web forms used to get these validation controls, ASP colon, regex validator, that kind of thing. And actually in web forms, they could have made these more flexible, but they weren't really very flexible. Yeah, you could put regex in, but I think there were certain ways they could have, you know, added things like, say, standard email regexes, standard address regexes, you know, even making um, text boxes validate by default and those sorts of things just to make it secure. But Basically, they didn't change very much over the lifetime of web forms and still haven't changed very much. So they were kind of OK, but again, more server control uh, mumbo jumbo. MVC is much more along the lines of using an attribute on the model. So theoretically, that's where the validation should be. If this is if this is a user and a user has an email address, then it should be at this point that I define what that email address looks like, how long it is, whether it's allowed to be more than 250 characters, whether it needs to be an app symbol, whether it needs to be a simple email address or whether it needs to support the full validation of an email address, which is actually quite complex, then all of that belongs on the model. Now, that creates less duplication because if I have, say, a, a regex validator for validating an email address, rather than having to copy and paste that into lots of different ASPX pages, I can just put it on the model. But then, of course, the flip side of that is if I then need to say, well, in this view, actually, I allow a different validation than the other view. So maybe a normal user can't set a special email address, but maybe the admin user can. So in that case, using the same model would present problems because you'd want to have different validation, although you can either have logic. So you could have a, a server based uh, or validator, which can basically say, if I'm admin, do validate it this way, otherwise validate it this way. So you could do that or you could have separate models. You could have an admin user model and a, a normal user model. So you can get around it, but it certainly changes to the way that that's done. Login controls is another one. This is quite heavily used in ASPX just because it's a, a convenience. Again, you chuck in a login control, do this bit if you're logged in, do this bit if you're not logged in. Dead easy to use in, in web forms. But again, it required this view state. It, it required this tight coupling between the view and the code, which is not really very good for kind of extensibility and designability. So they don't exist in MVC like uh, most server controls don't exist. So you'd need to use an if syntax instead, which is straightforward. If you do a default ASP MVC app, uh, web app, and you set authentication to be anything other than none, you will see an example of this in the layout page. It will basically say if the user is logged in, brackets, render this otherwise render that so fairly straightforward to use but it means that you can't get a load of that kind of magic easy stuff that you got in web forms in terms of shared controls so these are the controls you used to have asax controls in web forms so it kind of worked a little bit like a mini version of as of a, an aspx web page but it could be shared between different pages so you don't have those directly in mvc but you do have this idea of a partial view which is much closer to what most mvc frameworks have so you're really saying it's the view that gets shared not an actual control you can switch these views in ajax so they can be quite dynamic but they can also be model bound so although they don't have all the same kind of crazy functionality that you would normally add in a shared control loads of kind of back-end code and stuff you can bind it in the same way you would bind a normal mvc view and that model can be the same as the parent model or you can have a, you know a property of the parent model which you could pass in so if you've got say the registration page that takes a user model you could have a partial view that takes a user model or you could say well actually this this control is for say i don't know the stock market price or something so then you could put a property in your user of stock market price and you could pass that property into your partial to make that work so you kind of get most of the same functionality but again it's more at the view level rather than sharing much larger parts of functionality 
of course you can share functionality you would just need to do it in the controller instead and then make the changes in terms of data to the model and then it's up to the logic in the view to say ah this piece of data exists i need to do something differently so it's a slightly different way of thinking about it and probably one of the the biggest changes is all of these lovely data controls that used to have uh, server controls including data controls you don't have in MVC so classic things like grid view repeaters all the rest of it and some of them have direct equivalents so a repeater can easily be uh, replicated with a for each loop because in Razor you use the kind of C sharp for each but things like a grid view you just don't have a grid view you would have to either use a library or you would need to generate it yourself so a grid view for example could be rendered as a table so you could render a kind of a, a heading row and then you could for each around an enumerable in your model and then generate a row for each of your items in enumerable but of course as soon as you want things like paging and all of those cool things you used to get in web forms you're going to have to do some extra work there some ajax probably or some you know some extra functionality in the view so maybe you have a query string parameter page number and then you use that in the controller to work out which page of data to bind to the model obviously like i say you can you can get library to do that for you but this is the probably the biggest reason why if you already have an app that heavily uses these data controls in say a corporate type of environment usually then you're probably or possibly better off staying with web forms because these things a grid view takes 10 seconds to to drop in bind it to a data source and it kind of just works automatically which is great and that's going to require a lot more work to do in MVC of course there are others that have direct equivalent things like your text box control the rest of it they all exist just as normal either as normal um, HTML controls or as the the syntax we saw earlier where we bind using razor we bind to a model property so they exist things like the validators exist in a slightly different way so a lot of them have a direct equivalent and a way of doing it the grid view is probably the one area where it's a bit different and in terms of ajax that works a little bit differently as well so you can't just dump an update panel in and it all just works for you you have to use a partial instead and you can update the partial um, which is a, a kind of a, a different subject at all so there's some kind of the major differences hopefully you can see there is a significant difference there's a difference in architecture a difference in philosophy uh, depending I mean if your apps are really simple it's very possible you could just directly port it without much effort almost certainly you will need to split a single page into several actions and if you want to go with one controller per page you could do that it might be a bit clunky but it would probably work but with any kind of complexity you're going to have to do a significant amount of work which then brings us to the question of approach and you know what's our starting point here and I'm obviously not going to be able to go into this in any great um, depth but you can contact me my details at the end of the slides here if you need any kind of professional help doing this but really the starting point is any kind of port any kind of rewrite requires that you understand what your system currently does and as simple and obvious as that sounds in most cases there are so many companies who literally do not understand all of the functionality of their existing app and that's for a number of different reasons it's because the people who wrote the original app don't work there anymore the people who define the functionality don't work there anymore even understanding whether the functionality is even correct is that a bug is it just always worked like that you know is that how it's supposed to happen is that calculation supposed to be wrong you know all of these kind of these weird things that we don't necessarily understand we have to take a business decision of do we understand this well enough to rewrite it and obviously if you're working in a financial sector for example your risk appetite is going to be much lower than if you work in maybe a software as a service environment we say well we understand it well enough we're happy to rewrite it we're happy to potentially break some things in the process hopefully we'll find those in testing we're happy to remove certain functionality that's just become so complicated it doesn't work anymore and we're just going to move on great but you need to spend that time understanding the functionality documenting it might be useful don't go crazy on that because people don't generally like documentation it takes quite a long time to generate it 
and if people are not in the habit of reading documentation it's going to be mostly pointless anyway but it will require that level of somebody going through and saying do we even know what this does do we even know why that button's there you know here's a button that never even shows up on the web application if it doesn't ever show do we even need to keep it or can we just forget it so you know that's always going to be a starting point from you know from the above idea of understanding that part of what you should be identifying is any complex areas that should be separated out so two factor setup is this something that really is not going to exist as one entity it's going to be like i say three or four actions and in most cases i think that's always going to be the case uh, except for very simple pages that might just display a message or something then you know they can probably just become a single action but in most cases they're going to come out but any particularly complex areas that are going to require some some careful thought and careful experimentation are things that you need to kind of identify sooner rather than later what you can then do with that is you can set up a basic mvc application at this point of course you don't really care what it looks like probably but if your, you know, if your design is relevant, is important, you might say, take some time and say, well, how do we set up a basic front end framework? If we use, let's say, Bootstrap to make it look a certain way, how easy is it to plug in Bootstrap? In fact, I think Bootstrap's the default framework anyway, but let's say it was a different one. Let's say you're using UE Kit or something. How easy is that to do? Let's spend some time just working out that, yes, we can plug this in and, yes, it will work okay. This is how we tell a button to look like a UE Kit button. This is how we tell a table to be a UE Kit table. So, you know, just spending that kind of initial groundwork, getting comfortable with how it works. How do you add a controller? How do you add an action? How do we connect it to our database? Does it even support our database if we're using, you know, Fox Pro or something awful like that? Can we, you know, can we even connect it to Fox Pro? Does that even still work? Maybe it does, maybe it doesn't. There are things that you can try out just a couple of areas and say, yeah, let's include some of our functionality. Let's include the basics. Let's include creation of an object into the database. Let's try what happens reading an existing item from our existing database. Can we read that? Does it come out as expected? And then as you're going through that, you know, making a list of any specific requirements, you know, authentication is that going to be difficult here? You're removing a login control. Do you use the login control? How are you going to replace that? You know, is what you do with authentication particularly difficult? How are you going to provide per action authorization? How are you going to make sure that people can't? you know directly reference object numbers which is normally what happens in mvc rather than hiding them away in the view state like you might have done before any custom javascript stuff if you've got your own javascript already that does loads of crazy stuff how are you going to port that across because that's obviously going to be written around the way webforms does it how are you going to work out how much work's involved to actually take that custom js and say we now need to make it work on these new pages that have maybe been split or merged or changed with ids that have changed so you know we you mustn't underestimate how much work that's going to be and of course any overly complex or brittle areas you might say well we We've got one page that really does all of the work you know in our application or that does that's 90 percent of the complexity is in this one place so how are we going to do some maybe some initial testing to see whether we can actually replicate what this does or is this going to end up requiring a complete js rewrite complete page rewrite complete functionality rewrite even do i need to change the user journeys to make this work more sensibly uh, because like I say, web forms allows us to get away with perhaps bad decisions that we should have um, we should never have done in the first place. Obviously, ultimately, you might need to consider, you know, just leaving what you've got and, and writing something from scratch and not trying to take the functionality across. Consider how you're going to separate the tasks for the different skill sets. So you could say, actually, maybe I'll get a designer working on some designs uh, and do that in parallel with one of the back end developers who's going to maybe look at how to connect to the database or whatever and see how those two skill sets are actually going to meet together, because that's maybe something you haven't been able to do before. And again, you can start considering how the workflows are going to happen, how the process is going to happen. Are you going to let your designers kind of make changes directly into the code area if they know how to write html why not let them push their own changes and not have to wait for the back-end developers to to merge them so there are other kind of management things you can at least think about at this stage or, or even try a little kind of a little trial project identify one example of everything 
So that's another way of going. You can look at complex areas. We might say, well, let's look at one grid view. Let's look at one repeater control. Let's look at one authenticated page. So identify one of everything allows you to say, well, here's one example of a grid view. If we've done it once, then we're going to be able to repeat it rather than you know thinking that you need to port everything before you decide whether you're going to port everything. You know, work out how you're going to do it. Placeholder, update panel, grid view. Already just said that. Try and avoid the temptation, and this is something I'm really bad at, of making other large changes at the same time. So I've been doing this recently. I've been porting a VB application to C Sharp. Now, it isn't as simple as just copying and pasting the VB into C Sharp because actually there are things you can do in VB that you can't do in C Sharp. But the danger is as you're doing it, you kind of think, oh, do you know what? That's a really bad abstraction. I think I'm going to you know, refactor these classes and make them make a bit more sense. Now, as nice as that is, the problem is when you then try to port something else, you go, oh, how does this work? I've now changed all these other pieces of code. So now actually that thing I'm now trying to port doesn't work anymore. So it's easier to port all of the existing stuff, even if it's a bit clunky, even if the, the abstraction is wrong. Get the understanding of what's happening. Make it basically work. Then spend your time kind of refactoring. Uh, there's no hard and fast rule about, you know, when is it, when is the amount of work too much to do now? There's no answer to that. But just be careful. You can end up going down a kind of a rabbit hole trying to work out um, how to kind of get back to where you were before. And, you know, really in conclusion, I think there are lots of things to think about. There are many reasons to port from WebForms to MVC, but there are reasons not to. So, you know, have that discussion. Have it honestly with your development team. Avoid the idealistic decisions of MVC is always better than WebForms. Um, think practically. Is this something your company needs to do? Does it need to do it now? Is it better to forget what's happened and write something completely from scratch and take the time hit on that? You know, there are questions for you guys that I'm not going to be able to answer uh, specifically in a presentation. It isn't an easy job. The architecture is different. They're both .NET. They both look like C Sharp, but the way they work is quite different. So some things will be much easier than others to port. You'll have to take that on the chin. The difficulty level will obviously depend on your app and the resources that it uses. If it uses data controls heavily, it's going to be much more difficult to port than if it's really a glorified website which will be much easier to port. So there's going to be a different difficulty level that you'll have to have that discussion about. But you don't have to decide before you've tried a few things. So that whole previous section, you can get an MVC application. You can do it for free. You can try authentication. You can try a few actions. You can try different ways of factoring it. You could even get two different developers to try things in two different ways and find out which one's easier. But try out those things and then maybe that will inform more easily whether now is the time for you to port what you have or whether now is the time to start really doubling down on your next release of a new system. Forget what you've done before, you know, start as you mean to go on with a new system written from the ground up without all of the, the technical debt that you've got in the old system, but taking the time and the resource hit to do that. So hopefully this has covered enough things to get you thinking, uh, highlighted enough differences so you can make a bit more of an informed decision. It is doable, but it's hard. But, you know, why not consider it? Why not kind of look at, at the way the world's going? Why not increase your skill set by getting people who are already going to understand MVC? My name's Luke Briner. You can contact me at luke at cotswolditconsulting.co.uk. Please know any general questions and comments about the video you can put below in YouTube. But um, please don't contact me at this email address unless it's for professional work. This is not for, I saw your video, please can you tell me how to do this for free? Because that's not my job. Um, but any yeah, general questions or comments I can answer on YouTube in the comments below. If you like the video, please hit the big like button and thank you for watching.